How y'all doing this evening? Y'all excited about studying God's Word? (laughs) Okay, I'm going to pray real quick for myself. So, Uh, Father God, you uh, have ultimate authority here. Uh, Lord, I submit my teaching to you. I submit my study. Uh, Lord, I submit my uh, direction. Father God, I submit uh, um, to your guidance tonight. Father God, intervene in whatever way is necessary. Uh, Lord, help me to teach only correct doctrine. Um, Father God, I just want to stay in line with your truth. Uh, We love you, Lord. More of you, less of me. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. All right, so um, I was given. um, uh, There is a, uh, what's I'm looking for? There is a a structure that was presented uh, as y'all are going through this year. And the thing that we're looking at tonight is growing through a commitment to the church. So this is about church growth and a thriving church. Um, So some real quick context when we look into uh, 1 Thessalonians. And we're in, you know, bro Joe went through it, so I'm going to try not to rehash the things that he preached. And uh, but we do get to we get to drag in some things that he did uh, reference this morning. So that was fantastic for me. All right, so Thessalonians was written by the Apostle Paul to the church in Thessalonica. That, that's pretty um, evident. Uh, it was written in 5051 AD. So all that means to you is it was one of his first letters. Okay, so it was one of the first letters that Paul wrote as an apostle. Uh, Paul, Silas, and Timothy, they came to Thessalonica on Paul's second missionary journey. So as he's cruising around on his second journey, he stopped in Thessalonica, and he founded that church. Okay. Uh, the Thessalonians were a diverse city and a diverse congregation. So they would have, they would, there were Jews, there were Greeks, and there were women. They were all expressed in this passage, so it was a very diverse group, okay? Uh, Paul sent Timothy back. So after they leave, Paul sends Timothy back uh, to the church in Thessalonica and got a glowing report of their faithfulness. He got a glowing report. Uh, 1 Thessalonians 1, 6 through 8. You have that, Colin? Oh, I found out something tonight. So as I go up there, and uh, <laughs> this is comical. So as I go up there and I present to Colin the, the scriptures that we read through each night, um, I am known as the guy that, that presents more, that Colin has to produce more passages than anybody else. I didn't know that, so I found that out tonight. He was stressing because he was on a cruise one time, and he found out I was preaching, and he knew I probably submitted about uh, 15 to 20 uh, passages that someone had to dig up, and he wasn't here, so... Uh, all right, so 1 Thessalonians 1, 6 through 8 says, You also became imitators of us and the Lord, having received the word in much tribulation with the joy of the Holy Spirit, so that you became an example to all the believers in Macedonia and Achaia. For the word of the Lord has sounded forth from you, not only in Macedonia and Achaia, but also in every place your faith toward God has gone forth, so that, so that we have no need to say anything. So basically, what happened was when Paul was here, he was here, like uh, uh, Bro Joe mentioned this this morning, he was here for a very short time, possibly like three weeks. So it's not like, uh, like in Ephesians, I think in Ephesus, he was there like two years. So basically when he came and founded this church, he was there three weeks. So you, you get the idea that, that what was founded here was something special because when he leaves and he sends Timothy back, um, uh, he gets a glowing report, and it says that the, uh, the, for the, Lord, the word of the Lord has sounded forth from you, not only in Macedonia and Achaia, but also in every p- place your faith toward God has gone forth. It was, they had a, an active faith, okay? So three weeks in, and that's what they got. Now, why do you think uh, you could see the faithfulness of the people? 1 Thessalonians 1.5. For our gospel did not come to you in word only, but also in power and in the Holy Spirit and with full conviction. Just as you know what kind of men we prove to be among you for, uh, among you for your sake. The reason this church was a thriving and a solid church was because it was founded on the Holy Spirit. The power of the Holy Spirit was what brought this church into uh, in- inception. Okay, And so that's why when Paul was only there three weeks, it wasn't Paul that... Um, Paul was a vessel, but, but God's power came through the Holy Spirit, and these people were solid believers. Okay, so Paul then goes on, uh, in the context of, this, of our study today, Paul then goes on in chapter 4 and 5 to give the Thessalonians the much-needed instruction they required for the structure and growth of the church. So as I was saying, he left only there three weeks. 
um, got a glowing report, but now he's sending a letter back. And in, in, in chapters 4 and 5, the chapter that we're going to be in 5, he's basically giving them some much-needed instruction. Okay? So as we, as we look at our passage today, we need to do so from the perspective of viewing a church that was founded through evangelism, Paul, Silas, and Timothy, grounded in Christ, and empowered by the Holy Spirit. That's what Thessalonians was. All right, so the church was an encouragement to Paul. Although his stay there was short, it was empowered by the Holy Spirit, and the converts were genuine. This is really neat. So when I started studying this, the first thing I thought of genuinely was y'all. Whenever this uh, ministry began, I'm going to say two years ago-ish, four years, it's been that, wow. Whenever this, this uh, ministry began, it was, it was founded short and it was quick, but I saw a group of genuine fundamental believers that came and so like this is this is the same thing that paul saw i see in y'all and that's exciting i see i see the same people here i see the foundation i see what god has done in your lives and that's kind of that's a neat thing to be a part of anyway so that's what i thought of when i um when i read this now when paul writes them he says um when paul writes them he says in first thessalonians first thessalonians 4 9 and 10 he says this now, as to the love of the brethren, you have no need for anyone to write you, for you yourselves are taught by God to love one another. For indeed, you do practice it toward all the brethren who are in Macedonia. But we urge you, brethren, to excel still more. What's the point? The point is, there's a couple of passages, I'm going to read one more, that Paul is admonishing them. So in other words, in some of, uh, like in Corinthians in Galatians these are letters of rebuke so Paul has heard something that's going on and he's writing to them to tell them this is not okay that was not the case of the Thessalonians everything he says about them they were solid they just needed more instruction they were young and growing first uh, Thessalonians 5 1 and 2 now as to the times and the epics brethren you have no need of anything to be written to you for you yourselves know full well that the day of the Lord will come just like a thief in the night so we were talking about, uh, today we talked about this, and we're going to reference it again, but it's the idea of the, the, um, the imminent return of Christ. Christ is coming again, okay? And Paul writes in 1 Thessalonians, he says, there's no need for me to write to you in regard to this because you believe that. Now, he did write and give them some instruction on what that meant for them to encourage them, but they were never curious. They, weren't, they never doubted the second coming of Christ. What's the benefit of that? Well, if you read 2 Peter, 2 Peter addresses a group that didn't believe in the second coming of the Lord. What do you think? I, okay, I'm going to ask y'all questions at some points, and y'all can answer if, if you feel free to. Okay, this is, this is going to be a teaching session, right? So, if uh, in 2 Peter, like I said, uh, Peter addressed a group that didn't believe in the second coming of the Lord. If you didn't believe in the second coming of the Lord, what do you think that would cause? What do you think would be the results of that for a group of people? Any ideas? Huh? They'd be hopeless, but it, it, what it does is it causes people to... Um, if there's Basically, there, there's no coming judgment. If you knew there was no coming judgment, how would you live your life? You'd live your life as if there was no coming judgment, if you're a non-believer, right? And so that was the idea. The Thessalonians were not these people. The Thessalonians, basically what Paul is saying here is, I don't have to write to you about the imminent return of Christ. You believe that, and you're living accordingly. Complete opposite of what the group of uh, 2 Peter was writing to. Okay, so the Thessalonians believed in the second coming of the Lord, and they lived a life accordingly. These were a solid group of believers. Our passage today... Now, we're not going to cover all of uh, this section, but in, the, in our passage today, we're, we're covering 12 through 22. In 12 through 28, this section uses uh, the Greek word adelphoi. It means brother, okay, or it's derivative. It uses it five times. So what, when you're studying Scripture, this portion of text is presenting the idea um, of it's giving you the sense of family. Okay, this whole thing, this community thing, it's giving you a sense of family. Our relationship with God the Father enjoins us together as brothers and sisters in Christ and assumes that our actions will reflect that intimate relationship. Does that make sense? Our relationship, um, our relationship with God the Father enjoins us together as brothers and sisters in Christ and assumes that our actions will reflect that intimate relationship. And we're going to talk about that because that's a big deal in the church, right? Okay, let's begin our passage today. 
We're in 1 Thessalonians 5, 12, and he opens up. He says, but we, request, we, uh, but we request of you, brethren. Now, just real quick, the we, the we is Paul, Silas, and Timothy. That's the ones that the missionaries that founded this church. And then he says the brethren. Now, this is written to the elect. Um, if you read 1 Thessalonians, one of the first passages you're going to run into is this idea of the elect. And what you're seeing is basically the elect is the New Testament idea of the remnant. It's a New Testament believer. That's basically what he's saying. So he's writing this to the brethren, the elect, the genuine Holy Spirit-empowered believers of God. That's who he's writing to, okay? Now, a relationship is presented here, okay? A relationship is about to be presented here in verse 12 between the church and the leadership. So Paul then goes on to say, he says that you, oh, and here, if you have your Bibles, I'm, I'm easy to follow. I think I am anyway, because I'm very linear. I'm going to go through passage, passage, passage. I'm not going to, any bouncing around will be up here, and you won't have to, you won't have to do your flipping. So I'll reference other passages, because I, I want to prove to you what I'm saying is not something that I'm just saying myself, right? But with that being said, you, if you just read along, you'll be able to follow my, my thoughts, hopefully. <laughs> uh, okay, then he goes on to say that you appreciate those who diligently labor among you and have charge over you in the Lord and give you instruction that you esteem them very highly in love because of their work. Okay, relationship presented. Who do you think it's between? It's between the pastorate and this is between the layperson, the congregation. Okay? Now, there's, there's some. Now, understand, I'm telling you, this is a thriving church. So, what you're going to read here is a representation of what a thriving church looks like, right? Now, these are the things that it says. So in the pastorate, these things should be true. It says that they diligently labor. It says that they have charge over you, and it says that they give instruction. Now, me and Brojo were talking earlier. This is really fun when you start studying the Greek words and you start kind of dissecting the, the, the original language. But the idea of diligently labor, uh, it, it's just like what it sounds, is they, to grow weary, to toil, to labor. So what he's saying is that the leadership okay, of that church, they toil, they, they grow weary, they labor, and they do that for the benefit of the congregation. I believe that the things that you see here, you see at our church. That's why I come to this church. I'm not saying it's perfect, but I see an assemblance of the pureness of what God intended for a church, okay? And I, and I see that here. But anyway, so the pastors, the pastorate, the leadership, they diligently labor. Do you understand what that means? It's the idea that, and, and I, I'm just going to speak for myself. I don't know how, but I, I know for a fact that uh, Bro Joe on a daily, hourly, minutely basis is concerned about your spiritual well-being always always most of the teachers are, the, are in a good teacher good leadership that's what's going to be they are constantly me when i go home i'm thinking of my lesson i'm studying my lesson i'm thinking of where i need to outreach i'm thinking of who wasn't in sunday school i'm trying to think of ways to connect with people i'm, th I'm trying to think of ways to uh push the men's ministry when you are um, following God's wills in leadership, you are diligently searching for him and seeing how you can further the body. But anyway, that was true um, in this, at, at, the, uh, at Thessalonica. Then it says they have charge over you. So basically, this, this idea of having charge over you is that uh, the way it's presented, I won't get too deep into it, but the idea is that it's an, accept, an accepted responsibility that the leadership has taken on. So in other words, I am, I am no one's boss here. N nobody's boss. Rojo is not anybody's boss. Well, he is. <laughs> but the idea presented, he is a shepherd. He has accepted the responsibility of leading you together. He talked about that this morning. That's his heart, okay? The idea that the leadership in this church, they diligently serve and they shepherd. They have accepted the, spirit the, the spiritual responsibility that comes with leadership. Uh, then it says they give instruction. Now, this is kind of neat. Uh, Malachi 2, 4 through 7. So I had to write a lesson on Malachi, and one of the things, the indictments that, uh, that God had against the priest. You know the priesthood in the Old Testament and what they were responsible for. Okay, he said this. Then you will know that I've sent this commandment to you, that my covenant may continue with Levi, says the Lord of hosts. 
My covenant with him was one of life and peace, and I gave them to him as an object of reverence. So he revered me, and he stood in awe of me. True instruction was in his mouth. Same thing that the Thessalonians, he says, the, um, they have charge over you and they give instruction. True instruction was in his mouth, and unrighteousness not, was not found on his lips. He walked with me in peace. They diligently labored, okay, uh, in uprightness, and he, turned, and he turned many back from in, iniquity. For the lips of the priest should preserve knowledge, and men should seek instruction from his mouth, for he is the messenger of the Lord of the hosts. The leaders of the Thessalonica church were doing what the priest in Malachi were supposed to be doing. They were continuing what the priestly covenant of Levi looked like. That's, that's the solid group that they had here, okay? Now, so let's look at the church's responsibility in this, in this relationship. It says the church. Uh, the church it says that you appreciate those who diligently labor among you and have charge over you in the Lord and give instruction and that you esteem them very highly in love. Okay, the, the word here, appreciate, it basically, uh, the way it's presented is that it's to see what they do and then to do it. When you appreciate them, it has to have the effect of you seeing that in the leadership and then you follow. Okay, that's, that's, the, that's what that word means. And then it goes on to say to esteem. And to esteem is to acknowledge their leadership over you, submit to it based on its evident fruit. So the only way that the things are true here, appreciate and esteem, is if they're seeing it in the leadership. Okay? And that's what's happening here. They're seeing the leaders doing what they're supposed to be doing, and they're willing to submit and follow. That's what's going on. So this church, these, these are characteristics you're going to see of a solid church. Paul gives us a picture of a thriving church, one that consisted of genuine leadership and genuine converts. In doing so, both responses are contingent on each other. Okay, this is a, it's a marriage, it's a harmony that these things work together, okay? A church will only thrive if this is the case. But there's one caveat in this relationship, and he expresses that in verse 13. Verse 13, he says, that you must live in peace with one another. Okay, this sounds kind of tricky. Now, remember what I tell you, that the, in this portion of text, he uses the word adelphoi, or it's derivative five times. So basically, it's the, the, the idea of community, family, okay? In this passage, he says here, live in peace with one another. It's, it's an imperative. It's not a suggestion. He's saying you live, with peace with, you live in peace with one another. The idea that it's, is that we assume, I'm sorry, the idea is that we assume as our biblical, as our biblical responsibilities of the church that there may, there may be times when peace and harmony is not inherent to the situation. Does that make sense? So as the pastorate serves and as the congregation follows, there are going to be times where there's correction that needs to be made. There's going to be times when the, you may feel like the pastor, pastor is going a different direction than what you feel like. So what, God, what, what Paul is encouraging them to do, and more so than encouraging, he's telling them it is an imperative, is that when all these things are going on, you keep the idea of living in peace and harmony with each other. Okay? All right. Okay, verse 14. Now, we, have a, um, we urge you, brethren, admonish the unruly, encourage the faint-hearted, help the weak, and be patient with everyone. Now, there's three ideas presented. He says, admonish the unruly. Basically, the word, I'm, I'm going to use my paraphrase, so we'll, we'll get to this, right? But basically, he's, he basically says, admonish means it's through instruction, so it's to reason with someone. So basically, it's reason with the slackers. That's what he's saying. So with the ones that are undisciplined, out of control, and they're kind of slackers, not lazy, just out of control, kind of undisciplined. He says, reason with them. Give logic. Use logic to them, okay? Uh, 2 Thessalonians 3, 6, and 7. Now we command you, brother, in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, that you keep away from every brother who leads an unruly life and not according to the tradition which you received from us. For you yourselves know how you ought to follow our example because we did not act in an undisciplined manner among you. There were people in this, there, were, there, there was a, a group of people in this area that lived in an undisciplined manner, okay? So what he's encouraging them is in the church, in the brotherhood of the church, when there's a time when someone needs uh, to be reined in a little bit as part of the congregation, that's something that you're going to have to do, okay? But we're going to talk about some key things, why, how that could even work, right? Then he goes on to say, encourage the faint-hearted. Now, this is kind of a neat um, idea, but basically, it's, it's, uh, 
it's ba basically saying that these people had probably dealt with a great loss to some degree and they needed to be persuaded not to give up. So when it says encourage the faint-hearted, the, the, the Greek word is here, they probably had a great loss in their life and they needed some real, real encouragement not to give up. That's, that's the idea. Okay, then he goes on to say help the weak. Now this is not the idea of a physically weak person. This is the people that are uh, that, that you see, you look in a society sometimes and it feels like that society will trample on people. And there are people that, that just, that society has just trampled on them. Okay? That's the idea. It's the weak in that regard. And so he's telling them to help the weak. And then he says, be patient with everyone. Uh, this is kind of a neat idea too. And it goes back to what we talked about earlier, live in peace. Each group had special needs that could generate reactions in others that would be outside. Gene Green said this, I'm sorry. Each group had special needs that could generate reactions in others that would be outside the harmony with, the, with their call to love one another. What I'm trying to say is there's going to be times in your life that you reach out to help a brother in one of these capacities and it's not going to be easy. Not all ministry is easy. It's not as all as like, hey, I, you need to ride to church, I'll pick you up and bring you to church. It's not always that easy. There are some things in this world that, that present some serious situations in people's problems or people's lives. And so the idea that he's saying is that when he says um, uh, to be patient with everyone is that as we enter into this fellowship, this brotherhood, understand that's the case and approach everyone in that manner. It's very, very, very important. In fact, if th these things, like I said, are part of a thriving church, if, this, if you're not patient with everyone, you will have uh, a, a direct consequence, a direct negative a consequence on the congregation of the church. You will, okay? All right, so now, this is kind of cool. So when you think about all these things that uh, happen, now I'm going to ask you all some questions again, okay? When you think about all these things it asked me to do, it asked me to uh, reason with the slackers and the undisciplined, encourage the ones who have had major catastrophes in their life. You just, you're just trying to encourage them to move on. It says help the weak, the ones that society has trampled upon, or be patient with everyone. If I'm called to do these things, what must be true? What must be true? Faye, if I'm called to... Uh, you've had a severe um, loss in your family, and I'm called to minister to you. What must be true between me and you? Huh? Say it again. Yeah, well, brothers in Christ, it must, it, 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 what must be true is that I have a relationship, a close relationship with you. How can I minister to you if I don't even know what's going on in your life? He's, pre he's presenting a picture of a close, intimate relationship with your family. Okay, and you know how it is with your family. Y'all got brothers and sisters. This whole idea of like be patient with everyone. Do you need patience with your bro Do you need patience with your brothers and sisters? There's an amen. I saw it on. I saw it on the lips. <laughs> yes, it's true with your family. That's the whole idea here, right? Okay, uh, so for me to reason with the slackers, encourage the faint-hearted, not give up, and help the weak, I must have an intimate relationship with them. I have to be close enough to know that these things are needs in their life. You have to be. You have to be involved. Um, now, for me to be patient with those whose situation requires special, maybe inconvenient attention, what must be true? For me to have patience with someone that, that presents uh, not an easy situation, what must be true? What must be true is that I must be approaching them with their best interest at heart. It always has to be the case. I must be more concerned about them than I am myself. That's another thing that is true of a thriving church. You're going to be more concerned with your brothers and sisters than you are about yourself. Okay? Then finally, knowing the needs of the fellow members and realizing that in each situation, some sort of correcting must take place. Now, this is a situation where you have a brother or sister who's fallen. They're making bad decisions in their life. Okay? You are the person that knows about it. You're the person that's close enough to them. You have to be the one to confront them. Okay, and there's a, there's a method to that in Matthew and stuff. But my point is, when you have to confront these things, what must be true for this to be productive? What must be true is that I am approaching them with restoration in mind, not judgment. 
That always has to be the case. You will never have a thriving church if when you approach a brother or sister in Christ who has fallen and making some bad decisions, if your heart is bent towards judgment, you will never accomplish anything that Christ has for you. It will be completely destructive. So the idea that must be true, these are implications, these are implied, that you must have a restoration in your heart. So as we deal with each other in our faith, we need to be close enough to know their needs. We need to have their best interest at heart. And we need to be seeing them from a heart of restoration, not judgment. Now, what's interesting, this isn't the pastorate. You look at these things and you're like, yeah, yeah, he's supposed to be doing that. Yeah, 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 he should be doing that. This is you. This is you as you deal with each other. Okay, this is a family here. Okay, verse 15. See that no one repays you uh, another, uh, see that no one repays another with evil for evil, but always seek after that which is good from one another and for all people. Okay. Um, 2 Thessalonians, 2 Thessalonians 3.15. we put that up, please? Yet do not regard him as an enemy, but admonish him as a brother. He's really pushing this idea of this, this congregation being a, a brotherly, family, uh, intimate relationship. Your church home needs to be a safe place. This place, once you walk in here, needs to be a safe place. I promise you, as soon as you step out, you're going to have opposition. So if you want the, all that stuff, if you like the opposition to confront, you just step out the doors and you can have all you want. But when you step into here, this place needs to be a, a safe place. You need to approach your brothers and sisters of Christ in a safe and brotherly manner. That's what he's saying here. Okay, verse 16 and 17. Now he's going to say, Rejoice always, pray without ceasing, in everything give thanks, for this is God's will for you in Christ Jesus. All right, now this is kind of interesting. So the verb tenses in each of these admonitions is plural. Okay, so what he's saying, he's basically saying, all of you should rejoice together. All of you should pray without ceasing together. All of you should give thanks together. It's a community. It will always be a community. That's the way God set it up. We're the bride. We're the bride of Christ, right? Okay, this is corporate worship, and it's God's will for you in Christ Jesus. Now, a couple weeks ago, we talked about this. It says, this is God's will for you in Christ Jesus. And a couple weeks ago, we had a passage, uh, two weeks ago, I believe, and the passage, in the, it asked the question, what is God's will? 1 Thessalonians 4, 3, please. For this is the will of God, your sanctification. It's that simple. You know what sanctification is? Sanctification is the idea that in this process of our salvation, that we are being made to look more and more like Christ. Okay, we are, we are becoming more like him as God deals with us in our lives. Okay, now Paul expresses this same idea in Philippians 2, 5, where he writes, have this attitude in yourselves, which was also in Christ Jesus. That's sanctification. The more we are looking like him, the more we're acting like him, the more we are showing him, then we are becoming like him. That's the sanctification process. Because when we first start, we don't look like him. We don't act like him, okay? We don't have the mind of Christ, okay? God sees us through Christ, but as we deal with each other, we don't naturally do these things, okay? Now, so in that, in that Philippians passage, this is cool. So it's saying, have this attitude in you, the same attitude that Christ had. Then he goes on to say in Philippians 4, 4 through 7, he says this. Listen to these, okay? He says, rejoice in the Lord always again, and I will say rejoice. Let your gentle spirit be known to all men. The Lord is near. Be anxious for nothing, but in everything by prayer and supplication with thanksgiving, let your request be made known to God, and the peace of God, which surpasses all comprehension, will guard your hearts and your minds in Christ. He says to rejoice. He says, but in everything, by prayer and supplication, with thanksgiving. These are the same three things we just read that he said in Thessalonians. He says, rejoice together, pray without ceasing together, give thanks together. This is God's will for your life. This is what sanctification looks like as a church. These are, what, these are what exemplify sanctification as a community of believers, okay? All right, <clears throat> our corporate worship has a purpose. It serves to unify the body of believers and build them up. The same Holy Spirit that empowered the church is the same Holy Spirit that unifies the church. 
That's, what, that's why Paul goes on to say in the next verse. The next verse, verse 19, he says, do not quench the Spirit. Unity is inherent to the Holy Spirit. Uh, Ephesians 4, 4 through 6, please. See if you, can, if you hear a common word in this or a common idea in this passage as I read it. Therefore, I, the prisoner of the Lord, implore you to walk in a manner worthy of the calling with which you have been called. With all humility and gentleness, with patience, showing tolerance for one another, being diligent, being diligent to preserve the unity of the Spirit in the bond of peace. There is one body, there is one Spirit, just as also we are called into one hope of your calling, one Lord, one faith, one baptism, one God and Father who is over all and, and through all and in all. Did you all hear a common word there, a common theme? What was it? Oneness, that's exactly right. That's what the Holy Spirit brings, okay? So, the, the interesting thing, you do not have to create unity. We were not called to create unity, okay? As a believer, you're not called to create unity. It's inherent to the Holy Spirit. Your job is to get out of his way. In other words, you don't create it. The Holy Spirit does. You just don't create dissension, you let the unity flow through you. You don't have to create it. God does that when he gives you, imparts the Holy Spirit upon you. It's inherent to the Holy Spirit. One body, one Lord, one God, one baptism, one faith. That's the idea that what the Holy Spirit brings to the situation. We're just called, when he says do not quench the Spirit, that's the idea. You don't have to create unity. You just basically are called to not create dissension. Don't mess up what the Spirit's doing. If the Spirit is working in someone's life, if it's doing something, don't mess it up. Don't get in the way, okay? All right, verse 20 through 22, and we'll kind of wrap this up. Oh, I'm sorry. But do, uh, do not despise prophetic utterances, but examine everything carefully. Okay, now, so this is, gonna, this is, where, this is where context is going to be a big deal. So you talk about this idea about prophetic utterances and prophecy. Understand that what when did I, was this when did I say was this earlier or, or late in Paul's uh, writings as a as a a letter, huh? Early. That's exactly right. So scripture was unfolding as he's saying this. You get what I'm saying? This is like one of the first books he wrote. There's many more books that he's going to write. So understand that within the context of this scripture, this phrase prophetic utterances refers to the revelation of God's word as it was unfolding. Okay, it's not saying prophetic. Uh, it's not saying that I have a, a prophecy that I'm speaking into your lives and you're supposed to live according to what I throw out there right now. He's saying in this passage that God is speaking through his apostles. He's, scripture is unfolding as, it's, uh, as he's writing it. And as it is, he's saying to listen to. Don't, don't rebuke it. Don't, um, do not despise prophetic utterances. Okay, embrace God's word. Don't despise it. Uh, this book was one of the first that Paul wrote, so Scripture had yet to be fully expressed. Today, and the reason this is important is because today we believe in the sufficiency of Scripture or God's Word. Does that make sense? So in other words, we believe that the Bible is completely sufficient. There is, there, there is no new uh, revelation in Christ. What we have in Scripture is God's ordained a revelation to us, okay? Alpha the Omega, it's all encompassed in there. His nature, um, his redemptive plan, everything. We're gonna study that next year, the whole meta narrative. But the idea is there's no new revelation, okay? That's the, that's, we live, if all you have is the Bible, it is sufficient for everything you could ever need. Everything, you don't need something else, okay? All right, Paul was exhorting them to love Scripture. And this is kind of neat. So this is another thing got to tie in. Um, do, in Sunday school, we're all in the same curriculum, right? So y'all would have all read Psalms 19 this morning? Okay, good. So Paul was exhorting them to love Scripture. And whether it was for correction or encouragement, that's important. Whenever he says to... Um, uh, do not despise prophetic utterances. The idea is that Scripture sometimes is going to be corrective, and it's not going to be easy to handle, but he's saying to love it, okay? Um, it's the similar idea presented today by King David in the 19th Psalm where he said, the law of the Lord, the testimony of the Lord, the precepts of the Lord, the commandments of the Lord, the fear of the Lord, the judgments of the Lord, all of these things, all of these um, instruction, guidance, correction, and anything that the Lord presents through his word, okay? 
He said in verse 10, they are more desirable than gold, yes, than much fine gold, and it was sweeter also than honey and the drippings of the honeycomb. That's David's words. David was saying, I love God's word. I love, correct, I love the correction that comes from God's word. Whatever keeps me orthodox. You ever, you ever heard the word orthodox? Okay, it, it, just, it just means straight. Okay, it's the idea uh, like an orthodontist, getting your teeth straight. Orthodox, it means your, your doctrine, your belief in God, your, your, um, uh, your theology is straight. And that's the idea that he's presenting here. So David loved it. He didn't care if it was correction. He didn't care what it was. But it, whatever, however God's word lined him out, he loved it. Okay? David embraced every facet of God's word, even the correction. It was more desirable than much fine gold and sweeter than honey. Do you all see God's correction that way? You should. A thriving church will. Okay, now uh, let's continue at the end of verse 21, 22, and then we'll close. It says, hold fast to that which is good. Now, um, the first part of this, hold fast to that which is good. Paul uses some strong descriptions here. This word hold fast, and then he goes on to say at the end, abstain from every good evil. So hold fast to that which is good, abstain from every good evil, uh, abstain from every form, form of evil, not good evil. Okay, Paul uses strong descriptive words here. Hold fast and abstain. Now, this is interesting. So the Greek word to hold fast has the same derivative. The Greek word to hold fast has the same uh, derivative. It's the same word, but in a different tense. Do you remember this morning when Brojo was talking about how the, the spirit of the Antichrist is going to come? And there's something holding it back. Do you all remember that? There's something holding it back. What was, what was holding it back? What did he say? Holy Spirit. That's right, girl. So when we're raptured out, the Holy Spirit is no, no longer there to hold him back. The same Greek word that he, that he uses to said to hold fast to which is good is the same derivative of the word to hold, that's holding the Antichrist back. Okay? Um, you should, wait, let me see here. You should hold good instruction, God's word, with all your might. It's the same life-giving power that holds back the Antichrist. The Holy Spirit, that life-giving word, um, the, the good instruction, all the things, the sanctification, you should hold that fast, okay? And that's the same power that's holding back. It's a life-giving power. It holds back the Antichrist when the day the Lord approaches. That's powerful words there, okay? Then, he goes on, then Paul goes on to say, abstain from every form of evil. The Greek word here literally, okay, abstain, it literally means to, this is weird. So Greek words, they're uh, so there'll be, there'll be a word and another word put together to, to create another word. You get what I'm saying? I'm saying that I'm butchering it, so forgive me. But that's the idea. So it's not like a book or, or something like that. It'll, it'll be a, two words to create a word with meaning, okay? And so the idea that, uh, that he used for abstain, it basically means away from and have. So away from and have. So it means to have something because far away something else does that make sense i have something because far away something else so they're diametrically opposed when he's saying to abstain from every form of evil that word basically is saying that i have this because i'm far away from that that's what abstain means the further i get away from that the closer i get to this they're diametrically opposed where one starts the other one ends always and, that, and he's talking about evil here. The further away you run from evil, the closer to God's goodness you get. The further it is away, the closer you are to God. They're always going to be in opposite directions. He was basically instructing the Thessalonian believers not to get, uh, I'm sorry. He was basically instructing the Thessalonian believers to get grounded in God's good instruction and run far away from anything else resembling evil. Do you all remember the story of Joseph um, in the coat of many colors? Do you remember the Old Testament story? So he goes in and um, Potiphar's wife tries to seduce him. What does he do? He runs. Guys nowadays, they'll linger 
You know, they think about it. You know, they may hide their rent, whatever. But Joseph didn't linger. He was gone, son. He didn't flirt with the idea. He didn't candy coat her with compliments. <laughs> he got out, dude, and he still, still got in trouble. But uh, God had to work on him, right? So that was what happened. But anyway, that's the idea. It's flee. And the further you flee from evil, the closer to God you get. That's what he's saying here, okay? So God, this, is, this is God's instruction for a thriving church. And what, like I said, what I think is neat is I see this here. I really do. I see this here. I mean, there's imperfections everywhere. Um, one of the things you'll find in ministry, you'll get hung up. Uh, it, ministry is tough, and I'm, and I'm not a full-time minister, but I'm involved in ministry enough to see the, 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 the difficulties in ministry. And one of the things you see is the more you're involved in ministry, you, the more you see people. <laughs> We're messed up, man, I'm telling you. And so the idea is the more you deal with people, the more the annoying they can be. And the more they don't listen and the more you see sin nature, but that's the whole idea is God has instructed us a way to make this thing work. It's gonna be empowered by the Holy Spirit. Um, you're gonna have good leadership who walks the walk. You're gonna submit to that leadership and you're gonna do likewise. You're gonna follow their lead because you know they have your best interests at heart. And then when dealing with each other, it's gonna be the same. You're gonna have patience for one another. You're gonna be close enough to them to know of their, their needs, okay? You're gonna put them first, all right? That's the idea. You're gonna be patient with everyone, okay? God is commending us to have an intimate brotherly uh, community here okay there's safety in this church like I said once you walk in here whatever you got going on with somebody you need to figure it out you need to get it resolved you probably need to pray about your what happens when you pray about someone else is God usually works on you because it's usually you that's messed up right you got an issue with someone else you pray about it God usually changes your heart that's ten, tend to uh, be how it works out but the idea is when you walk in here it's safe we're family here okay we're all one body one baptism one Lord one faith you know, it, there's unity in the spirit. Don't get in the spirit's way. But this is what a thriving church looks like. And I'm going to encourage you to continue what you are doing because I really see that. I see, a, I see a family here. I think it's kind of cool. I really do. And I admonish to the leadership. I know there are people here that, um, that when this started coming about, they, they embraced it and these people are still here today. So I see that and that's, a, that's commendable. It's a, it's, a, it's a marathon. It ain't a sprint, right, brother? It's definitely a marathon. It ain't a sprint. Sometimes you wish it was a sprint, right? Because I'd sprint right to the Lord. If he came back right now, I'm gone. I'm not, holding, I'm not clinging to nothing here, brother. If he's taking me, he's taking my family, I know where my intimate, I know where my uh, close family is going. So we're, we're booking them out of here, brother. <laughs> this ain't my home. Anyway, um, I appreciate y'all tonight. Um, understand this. If you are a believer, I hope that uh, this was encouraging to you and I hope that you saw some things. Typically, whenever... Um, when I listen to like Pastor Joe preach, um, I, I generally remember the whole gist of everything, but there'll be some, some really neat things that he says or that people say that, that stick with you. And I hope that was the case tonight. I hope there was something that stuck with you because here's the deal. I don't expect you to remember all of this, but I expect you to remember some of it. And you're going to start imparting some of these things in your life and you're going to build a resume. Uh, you're going to build a resume of um, God's word and his structure. And that's, that's the kind of stuff that's going to keep you in line. You got to stay in God's word. It's imperative. It's not even, it's it, like that was the whole thing with uh, today in, in uh, Psalms 19. It's essential to your uh, livelihood as a believer. It's not an optional, not optional. Uh, I'd like to open things up. If there's someone here tonight that feels the call of the Lord on their heart, or if they just want to come in here and pray, um, I guess the praise team can come up. And, uh, but yeah, I, I really appreciate this opportunity, and I hope that God spoke to you. Uh, tonight through me I hope that I didn't take away from God's message uh, that's one of the things that always scares me uh, when you stand up here is I'm going to be responsible so one of the ideas is that I, when I step up here I'm responsible for what I teach y'all and that's a scary scary thought because I do not want to lead you um, I don't want to lead you down the wrong path at all but I trust that God's grace covers it and if my heart's bent towards him he's going to intercept it before it hits your ears right anyway I love you and I'll pray and we'll enter a time of um, uh, invitation uh, thank you, Lord, for tonight. Thank you for the opportunity to come and spread your word. And Lord, I pray that uh, this was edifying. Uh, I, I pray that, uh, Lord, to hear your word expressed and to hear and to hear the, the worship and to, to feel the, uh, the fellowship and the love here, Father God, I pray that that was edifying to you. I pray that it was uh, pleasing to your ears, Father God. We love you, Lord. Uh, Lord, our hearts are bent towards you. I pray that you continue, to me especially, to... Um, 
intervene in my life, Father God. You have absolute authority over me, and I'm submitting to you whatever way, Father God, that you want me to submit. And I pray that in doing that, Father God, that as I submit under your leadership, that others will submit under uh, my, my fellowship of you, Father God, and we'll all uh, join in your, your family. Uh, it's in your name, heavenly name, I pray. Amen.